Welcome to Fustat Port Ghalib, situated in Umel Rus Hills, which is part of the eastern desert of Egypt. Here, ancient Egyptians were extracting gold to enrich the pharaohs of the first nation state of the world. Through this presentation, we would like to introduce to you the desert environment with its wildlife its nomadic inhabitants and the mining activities that took place in its inhospitable landscape. Since life first emerged on its surface, the Earth has witnessed a series of climatic changes. Today, one third of the Earth's land surface is arid or semi-arid. Due to this aridity, the terrain loses nearly all the water it receives through precipitation by evaporation, creating a dry, barren scenery which is defined as a desert. The eastern desert of Egypt is part of the Saharo Arabian Desert, covering an area of 10 million square kilometers. It presents a combination of maximum frequency of sunshine, low humidity, and irregular infrequent, randomly distributed rainfall. Ecosystems consist of living creatures and minerals, functioning together as one, in mutual, often very complex interaction. Ecosystems can be marine, like the coral reef, terrestrial, like the rainforest, or both, like mangrove swamps. It can be as small as a pond, or as big as the biosphere, which is planet Earth. In desert or arid ecosystems, the survival of plants and animals depends on their ability to maintain a favorable balance between water uptake and water loss under such an unreliable moisture regime. The eastern desert ecosystem changed from a savanna to an arid ecosystem. The plants and animals living here had to adapt to the new conditions of severe drought. Some could not cope and had to migrate south following the new savanna boundaries. To adapt, some plants restrict their whole life cycle to the rare rainy occasions called ephemeral plants. They grow after the rainfall and die a few months later. Some other plants have special mechanisms to reduce their water loss and increase the uptake during long periods of drought. These are called perennial plants. The Acacia tortillis of the eastern desert is an example of perennial trees. To reduce water loss through transpiration, some trees diminish the number of living branches until only one branch is alive. It has an extensive deep root system that can penetrate to great depths, reaching 60 meters, for the acacia to reproduce. The seedling will need a sufficient amount of water to develop tap roots and small but necessary foliage. This will require repeated rainy periods. Here in Umel Rus, such conditions were present in the late 80s and again in the mid-90s, when this area witnessed successive years of rainfall that allowed several seedlings to sprout. Animals also had to adapt to survive in this arid ecosystem. One example of animal adaptation is the dromedary camel. For a long time, the dromedary camel was living in the Sahara region but disappeared around the turn of the first millennium BC, only to be reintroduced in the domesticated form with the Persian invasion of Egypt in the fifth century BC. In sandstorms, it has the ability of closing its nostrils to prevent sand from entering. Its eyes are protected from sand and dust by a double row of thick eyelashes. Its feet are pad-shaped to allow them to travel easily in sand. 
it can raise its body temperature to over 40 degrees Celsius to reduce water loss through sweating. It can tolerate twice as much water loss than most other mammals could. This enables it to go for long periods without drinking. It can also rehydrate quickly, being able to drink up to a quarter of its weight in 10 minutes. Its lips are thickened to allow it to consume thorny plants. It will kneel to load passengers or cargo and can cover long distances in heavy sandy terrain where even the best 4x4 vehicles will experience difficulties. Because of these characteristics, it's been dubbed the ship of the desert. Humans are often part of ecosystems. This is the case in the eastern desert where people inhabited the region interacting with the environment and other living species from as early as the Paleolithic period. Anthropologists believe the cradle of the human race was in East Africa. From there, the modern humans started a long migration process to colonize the rest of the continents. For millennia, the modern humans, called Homo sapiens, meaning wise human, lived as hunter-gatherers. Around 20,000 years BP, a group of humans of Caucasian descent living in the region of the Africa Horn and the Yemen mountains developed into pastoral nomads. It's believed that during this time, due to the Ice Age, the sea level was 120 meters lower than today, which created a land bridge between the Africa Horn and Yemen. By the end of the Ice Age, the ice cap started to melt and the land bridge was submerged under rising sea levels. This group of pastoral nomads got separated, giving birth to the Semitic people in Arabia and the Hermetic people in East Africa. These names were given by the anthropologists under the biblical history's influence, where Noah had several sons, including Sem, Ham and Japheth. While the climate was changing, pastures became weak and could not sustain the growing number of livestock. Some of the Hamites started migrating along the Red Sea coast to the north. Crossing the Nile Valley, they settled in the heart of the Grand Sahara, which was still a savanna. As the desiccation advanced, they split into the northern Hamites, who settled in the Atlas Mountains and the Sahara's oases, the descendants of which are the Berber tribes of North Africa, while the eastern Hamites came back to settle around the Nile and later on ignited one of the greatest civilizations in human history. The inhabitants of the eastern desert are the descendants of the first Hamite migration waves along the Red Sea coast. Today they form a group of tribes called the Beja. They speak the unwritten language called Tubidawi. The Ababda tribe, living in this region, has been Arabized since the 14th century, but still conserve the millennia-old Beja culture, separating them from the other Arab Bedouin living in the northern part of the eastern desert and in Sinai. It takes tens of thousands of years for an ecosystem to reach equilibrium between its different components. But only a few decades of human bad practices to topple it. Desert dwellers use wood for fuel. But over-exploitation of this resource leads to deforestation, which in turn leads to desertification. Drought can cause desiccation, causing creatures to live under stress due to the lack of water. However, species living in arid ecosystems have adapted to these conditions. When an area is subject to deforestation due to overgrazing or too much firewood collection, the soil is exposed to wind erosion. Furthermore, the removal of shade will increase the evaporation and salts are drawn up to the surface. 
the soil salinity increases and plant growth becomes impeded. This is desertification. The mining activities in the eastern desert required fuel to forge mining tools, to cook for the workers, to fire bricks, and burn lime for construction, and so on. The primary source of this fuel was wood from the desert trees. To exploit a gold mine like Umel Rus over centuries, hundreds of trees were scarified, exerting a substantial impact on the delicately balanced ecosystem. One can imagine that the wadi bed could have been much greener with many more acacia trees than we can see today if there had been no gold veins in Umm El Rus. Shining yellow gold was admired and desired for millennia. It was available as a native metal that did not require complex or laborious smelting procedures. Gold formed deep within the earth's crust is forced up through fissures in rock veins usually in quartzite. Vein gold is obtained by breaking and grinding up the rocks from a vein to release the particles of gold. However, nature lends a hand and over millions of years, wind, rain and frost break up the gold-bearing rocks. Grains and nuggets of gold are washed down into the riverbed or what was once a riverbed this is called alluvial gold. Initially, the exploitation took the form of hand-picking these grains and nuggets downstream from a gold vein. Later, a more productive approach was panning, in which the sand and gravel is scooped up with water in a pan-like vessel and swirled around. The sand and water slosh out over the sides of the pan to leave the much heavier gold particles in the bottom. As the Egyptian civilization advanced, the pharaohs sent missions of hundreds of workers to break the gold-bearing rocks from a vein and grind them into powder. It's thought that this laborious effort necessitated a workforce made up of prisoners of war, slaves and convicts. The ancient Egyptians defined three gold mining regions in the eastern desert. From this area, the gold of Koptos was obtained. Koptos was an important trading center on the Nile, controlling much of the eastern desert produce. Further south, the gold of Wawat was obtained from Wadi Alaki area. From still further south, from what is now Sudan and even parts of Ethiopia, came the gold of Kush. In pre-dynastic and early dynastic times, gold mine exploitation was fairly sparse but it was mainly the gold of Koptos, which was exploited until the Old and Middle Kingdom. The exploration of southerly gold sources might suggest that by the early days of the New Kingdom, the sources of the gold of Koptos were largely exhausted within the capabilities of primitive mining technologies. In the late New Kingdom, the focus seems to have switched back to the gold of Koptos, perhaps because newly developed mining technologies were introduced to make the exploitation more economic again. By the time of the Arab invasion of Egypt, the mines of the gold of Koptos were again exhausted. As the English, in their turn, invaded Egypt, they applied their advanced technology based on mechanical machinery to extract the last remaining ounces of the gold of Koptos from some remote mines like Umm El Rus. In the years between 1902 and 1958, this exploitation led to a reported production of almost seven tons. Recently, further geological surveys have been made, some with the aid of satellite photographs, and the renewed exploitation of these ancient mines is once again under consideration. 